Ben Jacobs, welcome to the Dispatch Podcast. Thanks for having me. Ben, I, w- I want to begin on just understanding what a caucus is. What is the Iowa caucus? What are the Iowa caucuses? Do you use caucus or caucuses when you say it? I've seen both uh, variations. Uh, and how does it differ? Hawkeye. Hawkeye. And how does it differ from uh, the primaries, the New Hampshire primary coming up for, for listeners who just may not be familiar with the differences? Well, you know, the caucus is something, the basic concept of a caucus is a party run primary. And uh, Iowa, you know, the one thing that sort of people get confused is that the Democrats, when they were doing a caucus before the DNC jumped in, had a lot more rigmarole than uh, Republicans did. That for Republicans, this is basically a firehouse primary, that folks are showing up and casting a uh, casting a ballot. It's an in-person vote that there's none of the sort of re- realignments. There's there's all this sort of complicated stuff that, you know, when folks are trying to get their heads around the Democratic stuff. This is basically folks, uh, folks are showing up at a uh, school or someplace like that um, at a specific time and then casting a vote in a party run primary. It's not terribly different from a conventional election other than it's a different term and sort of a lot of what's driving this is that it's it's a party run process and there's you know you have to show up at a specific time there's not an entire you know 12 hour range of a day to vote um but other than that the mechanics of this just people showing up and vote yeah explain that because i actually think this is interesting to listeners and i guess the democrats used to have a different process for the, yeah. for 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 the caucus of trying to persuade people but what we're going to see in the republican caucus coming up is basically the only difference from a primary is that people are going to show up at a specific time and place probably going to have to hear mm-hmm. some speeches uh from yes. uh a, a representative uh, of a candidate who may be prominent and a good speaker but in many cases, uh, may not be uh, a very good speaker yes. or prominent. So just explain that that dynamic. This is – the only difference is you have to show up at this time and place and hear a speech. Yes, yes, yes. That That's that's the key fundamental mechanical difference in terms of what's going on. That this is – because this is a party process, this is also used for the parties to elect – Various various party officers conduct party business that, you know, it's a precinct happens at a precinct level. So then they elect people to a county convention, go on to a district convention and state convention for sort of all the business of the party that which happens after the primary vote. But before that, because everyone's gathered, you know, that this is there's the folks give speeches on behalf of their specific candidates that there's, you know, that. You know, every member of the Trump family will show up at a caucus site, for example, and go to different places and and speak. Um, but you know, you have seventeen hundred roughly precincts in the state of Iowa, so that you'll have seventeen hundred speakers, uh, give or take. So that you know, it's not always going to be prominent that some places, in a lot of places, frankly, it'll be folks from the community speaking on behalf of their neighbors, and it's a less effort to organize around the candidate that obviously a ton of people will show up knowing who they're voting for, but not, not everyone will and a chance to persuade or a chance to sort of uh, nudge people at the last moment and try to see if you can get a change, change of heart. It doesn't not even the most eloquent speech, of course, can't always <laughs> persuade people as I'm sure Jamie can testify to, uh, but uh, but it does add a slightly different feel to this. That this is a much more uh, not informal per se, but sort of uh, more old fashioned sort of thing. That it's it's something that you know that uh, you'd feel more out of sort of a nineteenth century concept of politics in some ways. Well, well, what Ben was referring to that I, I uh, I'm able to comment on is is uh, as Ben suggested that you don't even have to be an Iowan to give the speeches and and I was not aware of that when I covered uh, the the caucuses in 2016 and and at a journalist party uh, the night before uh, one of the caucuses uh, Ben informed me that I actually was eligible to to go to a caucus and speak on behalf of a, of Jim Gilmore a candidate. Uh, who was running in 2016, who wasn't actually competing in Iowa and didn't have any representatives on the ground. So, in fact, I, I went to uh, the caucus and, and gave a speech on behalf of of Jim Gilmore on on Ben's uh, Ben's suggestion. 
Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, he got uh, the exact number of votes he would have gotten without me, which was zero. Uh, but, but I mean, I guess how is this fair in in a certain sense? Uh, the the Iowa the the New Hampshire primary, you have a whole day to go and vote. There's nothing really different with the caucus other than, again, you have to go to a time and place to cast your ballot. And that time is like 7 p.m. at night when some people might not be able to get away from, uh, you know, their family because they have kids uh, to to uh, go in in, in caucus. Uh, some people might have to work. I remember leaving the caucus in 2016. I, I went and got a, a Subway sandwich. That employee there, you know, he, he had to be at his job. He could not go. Uh, if you want to do and vote for Jim Gilmore uh, in in the in the Iowa caucus, how is this a fair a fairer process than a primary? It seems to me kind of unfair. It's it's different than a primary, but you know, remember, part of this is about organization, and that you know, caucus is it's part of it traditionally. It's sort of dealing with tacking on sort of a presidential selection process to a traditional to a party organization process. So it gets a lot more people involved in the party process that, you know, after after the folks are voting, folks are then, you know, dealing with suggestions for party platform, for party offices um, and gets people in. But it's a test of organization that it's it's measuring a different muscle than uh, than a primary is um, that it's, you know, particularly about being able to organize people and get people out who, you know, are more sort of passionate and committed to this, that, you know, it's a type, it, the argument would be as, uh, you know, that we're dealing with a nominating process, not, not an actual election and sort of trying to figure out what, what, you know, that there are different candidate skills, that the uh, necessity to build a strong organization is different than, than the necessity to inspire a marginal voter to show up at the last minute um, to appear at a polling place. Um, and that it's sort of different skills in different parts of the Canada, that this is obviously, you know, creates, creates its own issues, but it's, it's, you know, that this is part of a nominating process, an internal party process rather than, you know, an actual democratic election. So that this competes in different things and measures, measures different, different skills for a Canada. Well, I, I want to follow up on, on the, the types of muscles that it, 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 deals with the the Iowa caucus, the different types of skills. Um, but I just want to make clear to to the listener that I gave a speech on behalf of Jim Gilmore, not because I, I supported Jim Gilmore, but as somewhat of a, of a, of a lark. He, if, if, if you remember, he ran in 2016. He was something of a, a Twitter punchline, and, and this seemed like a, a, a somewhat funny stunt. Um, I, I was um, not a, I a Jim Gilmore supporter. <laughs> well, I was, you know, as a as opposed to a member of the militant Jim Gilmore uh, online base, the Gil Hive. <laughs> uh, ben Ben likes to bring this up every uh, every now and then on, on Twitter and, and suggest I am a, a Gilmore supporter. But Ben, to to the question of the different muscle uh, that this exercises, is there a a strategy? I mean, every time the Iowa caucuses uh, come up every four years, you hear of a, of a candidate who he's going to all ninety nine counties uh, in Iowa, and I think that's the number to to uh, yes. to win. Or, you know, they're going to flood Iowa with, 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 uh, operatives like, you know, Howard Dean did, uh, when, when he was running and, and lost. Uh, or, you know, they're going to live in Iowa for a few months and focus on Iowa and living in Iowa is going to be what brings them ahead. Is there any strategy that has proven to be the strategy you want to employ if you want to win Iowa or, or, or overperform what people expect you're going to do in Iowa? I mean, I don't think there's any individual strategy and, and sort of with the caveat, the Democrat system actually is slightly different. The Republican system is one man, one vote. The Democrat system actually slightly more or did rather, we should speak of it in the past tense, may its memory be a blessing, slightly more resemble the Electoral College, actually. Um, but, you know, the idea of kind of going to 99 counties, that it sort of has a twofold thing that one of it's actually going out and going to all 99 counties and going to places like Adams County, Iowa, which has a population of 4,000 and trying to appeal to the handful of voters there. But it's also it's also a marketing line. It's a punchline. It's a sign if you're committed to this grassroots campaign um, and that it's sort of the, that it's as much a uh, messaging ploy as a, as a strategy that obviously once you've gone to, you know, 90 the difference between going to 98 and 99 counties isn't isn't that 
significance in terms of the numbers you've read it, but it sort of has its own branding, particularly because Chuck Grasley, um, who's been in the Senate from Iowa for 40 plus years, has sort of made it a point to go to all 99 counties. But that it's it's complicated because you're dealing with, you know, that, you know, obviously the best way to over you're dealing with a, a collection about expectations, um, which is what a lot of these primaries are setting expectations and doing that, that if, you know, if someone going to all 99 counties and appearing four times and individually greeting every voter at every pizza ranch, that sets the expectations very high after the level of expect, you know, level of effort you're putting into it. So that it's, it's a measure of doing that, but obviously the more time you spend in Iowa, the better, um, that traditionally, you know, helps people to win. It doesn't always help people to win. You know, the, the example of this on the Democratic side, speaking of Twitter punchlines, would be uh, would be John Delaney, um, who announced his presidential candidacy as a Democrat in 2018 before the midterms, he went to every county repeatedly, uh, was a three-term congressman, and then dropped out the week before the caucus after spending untold amount of his money and sort of just, you know, people have to have to buy what you're selling. What what is issues uh, from uh, seeing some of these town halls resonate most right now with Iowa voters? I mean, other than ethanol, everyone knows that, you know, there's an ethanol uh, kind of I mean, maybe you can explain it a little bit you know, that that Iowa pushes, uh, you know, a particular angle on, on ethanol subsidies. But is there a, an issue in the Republican primary that that uh, that gets people cheering louder than others? I know that when I covered the, the race. Uh, in 2016 uh, in Iowa and then elsewhere in 2012 and 2016. I mean, it, surprisingly, pro-Israel messages seem to get the loudest cheers from from an audience. But is there an issue that, that you've noticed gets the loud, loudest applause? I don't think there's an issue that sends it at the loudest applause. But the one thing I'd caveat is that ethanol really is much less of an issue um, than we've seen in the past. That after all, Ted Cruz, who was against the you know renewable fuel standards subsidizing the you know production of plant-based fuels in the United States won the Iowa caucuses in 2016 um, but which is part of a number of things that obviously fewer people are involved in agriculture these days that you have bigger farms um, you have more people involved in agriculture at this point who are you know that they're still important to the rural economy but has less of an impact when you're dealing with you know there are fewer small family farms, but also it's all about national issues. Like ethanol is not, you know, Fox News isn't doing segments about ethanol. Fox News is doing segments about, you know, trans high school athletes. Um, and, you know, we live in a much more nationalized society and that makes a big difference. It's sort of a level to which some of these local issues matter. And it's the same thing that you've seen with how people approach campaigns that, uh, you know, that the endorsement of your local state legislator is less important than that of an online right wing influencer, that, you know, we are in a much more nationalized politics world and that the sort of issue palette resembles a lot more of what uh, of what folks are thinking about nationally than than sort of the local issues that the the one caveat to this is there is a pipeline uh, from Iowa to North Dakota um, from ethanol plants to pump sort of the carbon dioxide there out into uh, caverns in North Dakota, which is a big green effort. And that has ferocious op opposition on the right. Uh, you know, that's something Vivek Ramswamy has been talking a lot about. Uh, so sort of, this is the government taking your land. And this is actually, you know, opposition to the ethanol industry. Um, though mostly done in, in the service of opposition to the idea that carbon dioxide is an issue, sort of protection about, you know, people's, uh, you know, about eminent domain for land. But that, that's the only real way in which this is popping up in a significant way this year.
Can you speak to, I mean, there's obviously calls mainly as it relates to the New Hampshire primary from some Republicans for Chris Christie to drop, drop out in order to hopefully consolidate the vote uh, around Nikki Haley. Uh, but my experience in Iowa is that it's kind of idiosyncratic on, you know, who's someone's second choice. I remember asking one voter yeah. in 2016, who are you deciding between? It was like Jeb Bush, Ted Cruz, and Hillary Clinton, uh, which was like, okay, I mean, how do, how do you line those up. Um, is it is it your experience that, you know, you can naturally figure out just by who the voter supports as their number one choice, who their second choice would be? Or is it uh, truly that uh, idiosyncratic that a lot of these voters have, you know, very weird rankings on how they would make their candidate list? Oh, a ton of voters are idiosyncratic. I mean, but it's sort of putting the idiosyncrasies into patterns. Uh, but sometimes those patterns are are very different that the one thing to use an example from the Democrat caucus in 2020 is that you had a lot of folks who were between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, for example, and then a lot of folks who were between Elizabeth Warren and Pete Buttigieg, which got in terms to sort of an education divide, a class divide, and sort of how folks talked about politics. That was sort of a beer track versus wine track thing to use that, uh, that language, democratic politics. Um, you know, Obviously, the Republican primary process is a little bit different this year because, you know, the key issue that's looming over all of this is Donald Trump, which is a divide that hasn't really existed in the past, even when Donald Trump was running in 2016 and how to deal with Donald Trump and skepticism over Donald Trump. And particularly in, you know, but that becomes a little bit more self-sorting as people see polls. If your number one issue is stopping Donald Trump. Um, people, you know, Nikki Haley may finish second in Iowa. Chris Christie may finish, you know, around there with Asa Hutchinson and Ryan Binkley in Iowa. And that voters <laughs> behave accordingly, especially when you have a specific number of voters who are voting strategically just to stop Trump. I mean, I had a piece for New York Magazine yesterday. Well, who, who's Ryan Binkley? A Is he a candidate? Is he a candidate running, Ryan Binkley? Ryan Binkley is a candidate. He's 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 visited all ninety nine counties. Oh. He spent seven million dollars. Um, he's he's on the ballot in just about every state. Um, and uh, you know, the mainstream media, led by Jamie Weinstein, is keeping Ryan Binkley from getting his <laughs> message out. Is he? Is it possible he does better than Chris Christie? This this person that I I would suspect that no one listening to this podcast has heard about. Sure. Yeah. You know, well, uh, seven billion dollars in Iowa. And Chris Christie hasn't, you know, Ryan Binkley showed up at their Lincoln Day dinner and spoke. Chris Christie did not. He spent seven million dollars, Binkley. So he's personally financing this his campaign. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I interrupted you. You're talking about a, a piece you did on uh, never Trump, never Trumpers and in, in the vote for uh, for uh, in, New yeah. Republic, I believe. I'm, I'm, I'm New York, um, and New I know York. Ryan Binkley can fascinate many people, so I understand. But <laughs> that uh, that there's a real effort to get independence um, in New Hampshire, where uh, you know you can, uh, if you're not a member of a affiliated political party, you can take a ballot in either party primary to take a ballot in the Republican primary and vote for someone to try to stop Trump, which at this point sort of is Nikki Haley, and that's. That's the real impetus uh, because it's really the, you know, the only show in town or, or was until Dean Phillips popped up. And it's a question of how much of a show Dean Phillips is making the Democrat primary, um, even without Joe Biden on the ballot. And that it's an opportunity to, to take a ballot. And uh, if you're able to, and, you know, there are a lot of independents or, you know, people who vote like Democrats or people who vote like Republicans, depending, but are sort of cautious about the label to get involved, you know, to show up and try to try to be an impediment to, to Trump. And you don't need a lot of people in New Hampshire to make to make an impact that, it, you know, if it leads to Haley win or close, you know, a narrow call for Trump who won New Hampshire handily in 2016, that that's enough to move the needle and to make some sort of incremental difference, even though Haley is obviously a down the line Republican. She, uh, you know, she no one's no one's ever accused her of uh, inciting people to storm the Capitol. <laughs> um, well, we, we were kind of speaking broadly about the Iowa caucuses. I think now we're getting a little bit more specific on on the current uh, caucus. So let's let's <laughs> delve into that a little bit. Has anybody handled Iowa 
uh, particularly well, any candidate, Republican candidate uh, this cycle that you have been impressed on how they've been organizing, how they've been uh, uh uh, on the stump in Iowa, uh, particularly good on the stump. Like I remember John Edwards when everyone talked about how how great of a stump speaker he was in Iowa when he ran. Is there anyone that stands out? Donald Trump. But how many times has he been to Iowa? Uh, not not a ton. He's not, yeah. but not not a ton. But it's not. But in how they've sort of managed the campaign and the mechanics of the me- campaign that are different than 2016 and sort of doing it within the limitations that at this point he is a former president traveling with all the sort of grandiosity of a former president Hmm. that uh, Iowa, you know, initially was going to be the state where Trump was really vulnerable, that, uh, you know, Trump lost Iowa in 2016, that Ron DeSantis has the endorsement of certainly a plurality of Republican state legislators. They spent a ton of money. They have a big operation there that, you know, they've lined up a lot of key conservative influencers in the state. You know, Iowa was, you know, Iowa is, you know, infamous is a state that sort of felt uniquely set up there that Iowa, of course, is at this point, it's entirely Republican at a federal level, but it doesn't have a single federal Republican. Every federal Republican who was in office in 2021 voted to uphold the 2021 election. You know, they all, for example, if you want to use another sort of MAGA vibes test, all the House Republicans voted to expel George Santos. That uh, it's, but it also has, you know, this big conservative, legit social conservative base. That there's a big divide. Um, in, you know, that there's obviously the Republican Party has become increasingly evangelical. But, you know, that if you look at the exit polls, these are people who identify as evangelical and go to church every week as opposed to people who identify as evangelical and go to close church less. This is in a lot of places, real, real old fashioned church. This isn't sort of, you know, televangelist mega church. This is it's a slightly different feel to it. And DeSantis, you know, hasn't been able to make the sale, but Trump has done enough that they've gone out and done the events and done done the work to build an operation when uh, that that looks like will not only be successful but you know at this point we're treating we're treating this the as a competition for second place that no one thinks Donald Trump's going to lose Iowa that this is all about whether Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis finish second that we're treating this like uh, you know the NCAA playing games in Dayton that this is a competition between two 16 seeds to see who hmm. might go on to have a chance to play the one seed in Trump. But, so but that, uh, that has been, yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, so uh, when you, when you land there uh, and I think you're going tomorrow, uh, well, when this comes out, you'll be probably in Iowa on Monday or on your way. Yes. What will you, what will you be looking for uh, on the ground? Uh, what story, angle or uh, other than covering it uh, are you particularly interested in uh, and do you think there could be a surprise i mean you said that we're treating this as 16 seeds but th- what what would surprise you what would be a, what would can be considered a surprise on caucus night at this point what would be considered a surprise on caucus night because of where expectations are is if you know there's there's this dynamic perf- if uh you know second strong second place performance from Ron DeSantis who has been moving in the wrong direction all year um, but, you know, getting a sense because they have invested money, they have built an organization and seen how much that, that actually makes a difference, um, you know, and, you know, what the actual mechanics of Victoria, think, looks like. Uh, maybe, uh, Victoria, I paused on my end. So maybe, um, have him just go back and repeat what he just said the last, uh, maybe 20 seconds of it. Uh, okay. So it came in. So. Maybe pick up, uh, maybe just continue what you were saying, and um, I'll jump in after that, Ben. Because she got it. She got yeah, what you said, um, so just continue. Okay, I'll, I'll start back in the middle of what I said. That, you know, obviously, you know, would be a big surprise uh, would be a really strong performance from Ron DeSantis, who has, you know, moved in the wrong direction in the polls and everything over the past year. But they did invest heavily in Iowa. They have this big organization. They have... You know, as I mentioned before, plurality of state legislators, they have all of these conservative influencers, and it's whether 
all the effort and all the sort of organizational muscle that they put in makes a difference uh, on January 15th. It would be a surprise because it sort of, you know, we talk so much about this is about the expectations game is that, yeah, things have been, you know, everything uh, that can go wrong with DeSantis's campaign has gone wrong, that it's sort of, you know, that they've had campaign turmoil, they've had a candidate to sort of really, uh, really been under uh, under a lot of uh, scrutiny and just sort of taking hit after hit, negative story after negative story. And it's, you know, a strong performance there, which sort of, Reverse would reverse that, um, and if that happened, which you know is still a possibility that you know they've spent untold amount of money in the state, um, both on the campaign side and on the super PAC side, that would be a surprise and that would make an impact in in the race and sort of really, really we figure because right now the conventional wisdom, you know, is that this is head and head between Haley and DeSantis, and if Haley finishes second, then uh, then. DeSantis is done. And, you know, folks are already uh, preparing, you know, to write DeSantis's political obituary. I imagine there are pre-writes that are mostly being done right now on this. So that would flip expectations. And obviously, me, if Ryan Binkley wins too, that would be a surprise. <laughs> um, let me just close on this, Ben. Um, you know, we, we've kind of been talking about really second place here in Iowa, who's going to be second place. Um and it's possible that Trump will just roll through this entire primary season and caucus season and there will have been really no competition. We don't know yet. Maybe things will be different in Iowa. Maybe the Nikki Haley will succeed in, in New Hampshire. But is there a strategy to unseat Trump that you have that that you think has not been tried by these candidates? Or are we just to take that if Trump wins this primary, that it was inevitable, there was nothing that could have been done? Um has anybody left anything on the table uh, in, in the sense uh, in terms of strategy to displace Trump from the top seat? Yeah, I, I look, I think there's sort of a lot of questions about how you handle Trump and sort of the uniqueness of Trump, that obviously what most candidates have done um, has been a campaign of sort of hugging, hugging Trump close. It's sort of that it's been like a boxing fight where the two boxers are sort of holding at each other without actually throwing punches because it is really, really sort of delicate because at this point, if you're a Republican primary voter, you voted for Trump at least twice in two general elections. If not in 2016 primary, you bothered to show up in 2020 that, you know, if a lot of the Republican voters who were deeply opposed to Donald Trump in 2016, the never Trumpers are Democrats now. Um, and vice versa, when you think about how many new voters that Trump has brought to the party, um, that, you know, you, that you needed, you know, this sort of to some extent has been the Chris Christie candidate campaign, but, you know, you needed someone as uh, going full Leroy Jenkins there to try to ease the blow and in a way that hasn't quite happened, that Christie sort of done his Chris Christie thing and sort of less of a credible messenger on it to the to the base. But part of it is. You know, especially once the indictments happened. I mean, if we look back to where things were, and particularly the order of the indictments, has made a difference. That started that Alvin Bragg going first probably shaped some of the coverage there. That you know, Donald Trump this time last year, if you go back to January 6, twenty twenty three, was a much weaker candidate, and uh, the mechanic the mechanics of that. Uh, the indictments and the entire process have changed things in in a way that sort of led everyone to rallying around the flag that everyone, you know, I mean, probably, honestly, if we're looking back in history, the the uh, the key moments in the Republican primary happened roughly three years ago in the immediate aftermath of January 6th, that after that, you know, if you look at where Donald Trump was you know, his sort of much maligned Mar-a-Lago rollout in the immediate after the midterms, you know, the guy immediately announced and had 40 congressional endorsements, give or take 20, 30 congressional endorsements, that he showed up in South Carolina in early January at his weakest and had half the state's major elected officials there, that no one had quite grappled with the fact that even if he was still politically weak, he still was close enough to incumbent. And 
that uh, that the Republican Party let so much of the narratives around January 6 coalesce into Trump's favor and so much of the narratives around Trump's term coalesce in his favor have created this very peculiar dynamic that has made things easy and easier for Trump, amplified by folks' own missteps and the fact that Trump has been helped by being out of sight, out of mind, that uh, be very curious what happens if you rerun this election with Trump on quit Twitter rather than Truth Social, when hmm. his, uh, his, what he's saying is much more visible than at this point you know, you, the, one of the, you know, one of the refrains of voters is that they didn't like the tweets, but if the tweets don't exist and they're just being broadcast into a void on truth social, it's, it's much less out of sight, out of sight, out of mind. Um, but, you know, you can run through 27 variables that I don't think any of this was inevitable. Um, you can see all sorts of scenarios in which things play differently for DeSantis or Tim Scott, or I don't know, maybe not Ryan Binkley. Hmm. Um, but, uh, but, but the way things have gone out is that Trump has gotten almost every single break in the same way that he did in, in 2015, 2016 primaries. Ben, safe travels to Iowa. Thank you for joining the dispatch podcast. Thank you for having me.